Every 13-year-old boy should be left alone with their own hotel room and a vault full of gold during summer break. Especially when there's apparently an escaped murderer trying to find them. Hi, and welcome to Belated Binge Harry Potter, the re-binge podcast that doesn't take itself or the books too seriously. I'm Zach, I'm your host, revisiting some of the most iconic series in recent memory that I nearly missed out on, like Harry Potter, where despite being the same age as movie Harry, I didn't read these books through till my mid-twenties. Now we're going back to Hogwarts, deep diving what's on the page and answering some of the hardest hitting questions in the fandom, like what did Dumbledore know and when, why does Harry only learn two spells, and are there any, any competent adults in the wizarding world? Today we continue our binge of the Harry Potter books with The Prisoner of Azkaban, Chapters 3 and 4. The Night Bus, and The Leaky Cauldron. The Belated Binge Podcast. Before we binge, there will be spoilers. This series wrapped up in 2007. If you haven't read them by now, you're even later than I was. There will also be adult language. You can buy them in the kids' section at the bookstore, but I didn't read them till I was a grown-ass man. Use earbuds as necessary. Shout out to... The bonus binge squad, it's Alex and Cade. For access to bonus episodes like my Behind the Mic series where I just open up a recorder and talk Harry Potter in my everyday life and drop them for you on Patreon, check out patreon.com slash belated binge. Special announcements. There aren't any special announcements, I don't think. Well, yeah, there's a special announcement. Check out the Restricted Section podcast. Uh, I just did a recording with them. We are in Order of the Phoenix. I can't remember what number the chapter is. Hang on. It is chapter 36, the only one he ever feared. It's the one where uh, Dumbledore is a complete badass and he duels Voldemort in the Department of ministries so it's a really cool chapter it's a really fun discussion you should check it out if you haven't already uh by now you've probably seen me post about it on social but if you didn't see that and you didn't hear that you should go hear it okay that's probably it for special announcements in case you were obliviated or you got your hogwarts letter late let's shove our faces in that white liquidy substance of our pensive in chapters one and two of prisoner of azkaban well chapter one nothing really happened um and that's okay we got a couple easter eggs and that was pretty much the gist of it uh chapter two harry blew up his aunt marge like the goodyear fucking blimp and that was great and that was pretty much the only thing that happened there and now you're up to speed so let's do priori incan chapter the part where our wands connect not the tips just the streams so we can recap what went down in the chapters we just read this week we start with chapter three the night bus harry is on the run literally full on just contemplating life as an outlaw it's glorious he might as well be on sons of anarchy because he is living that one percenter life for like like one percent of his life in this moment uh uh, he he the way he figures it is uh, he's already expelled because he just did magic he might as well do more magic to get his money and just go underground but he doesn't probably because he doesn't know magic Uh, or maybe because before he can actually do that uh, we need to take a break from exposition explaining how he's like all rich and shit but like you know i have to say kudos to this particular book starting out like there's a lot of reminder information in these early chapters but it is starting at this point to be weaved into the story a little bit more um chapter one's kind of a throwaway still so i guess i would say that the formula hasn't been uh perfected yet in book three but for the for a lot of what is happening um in these in these early chapters of prisoner of azkaban the 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 exposition in the um 
and the reminder information of like plot points or like main major things that have happened already that lead like feed into this story is being like weaved into the plot a little bit more um like i said we could still kind of do without chapter one for the most part but it was a lot better than chamber of secrets and uh i like this way of reminding us who harry is and reminding us that he's got a vault full of freaking gold and reminding us that he's a magic boy and reminding us that he's special and there's a serial killer that wants to kill him and all that stuff like it uh it gets better it just it just like is weaved throughout things that happen uh kind of starting in chapter two <laughs> uh, of this book um but that exposition it gets interrupted with this like prickly neck sensation that you get when you're about to be murdered i'm assuming that because i've never been murdered thankfully knock on wood um that was my head by the way um but that's what tv and books have taught me happens is right before you're about to just meet a gruesome demise you get a prickly sensation and goosebumps on the back of your neck and harry's having that now and he sees a big creature with wide eyes so he does what every logical 13 year old boy would do in this scenario he completely panics he trips falls loses his wand and almost gets hit by a violently purple bus he had apparently called the night bus somehow which makes no sense at all but we needed a way to get harry to london that wasn't his magic plan that he can't execute um sorry i'm I'm not trying to shit on the book but like this part is pretty fucking stupid sticking out your wand hand and you summon a magic bus isn't there a thing with magic in this world that there has to be like intention behind the things that you do you have to mean what you're doing e- even when harry sectum sempra's malfoy he may not have known exactly what the spell was going to do but he's in a fight with an enemy and intentionally uses a spell that he sees as four enemies he didn't do shit here he didn't even stick out his wand hand he used his wand like as a flashlight saw something scary tripped fell and lost said wand but you know that counts i guess If this thing shows up every time a magical person falls over and drops their wand, it's going to waste a lot of gas and have a very, very poor consumer rating. That's all I'm trying to say. But now we get to meet Stan Shunpike. And his best line in everything ever, 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 ever that I still say all the time to my child, you fell over for. It's absolute gold. A fantastic line it is delivered flawlessly in the movie it's so good and harry looked back at where there was that you know big black thing like a dog and and it was gone uh stan clocks harry's scar but he's not smart so harry's able to say that his name is neville longbottom and harry hires the night bus to take him to london i don't know i'm not going to describe the bus in like a ton of detail but you know it, it's silly they have beds instead of seats and it's not as ridiculous as the movie and no like tiny jamaican heads are happening in this but um we do get some some kind of funny dialogue with like you know muggles don't listen or look properly never notice anything and that is a true fucking statement um stan also has a daily prophet and harry sees the guy that he saw on the muggle news this is sirius black apparently he's a famous criminal and broke out of azkaban the article explains how he killed 13 people with one curse well done peter i i mean serious uh he says he looks like a vampire but we know that's snape so i think sirius would just be offended that he was compared at all to snape and stan explains that black was a voldemort supporter supposedly and how sirius killed a bunch of people one wizard 12 muggles and laughed as they arrested him nobody's ever broke out of azkaban until now and we get this nod toward dementors but nobody's calling them that for like way too long way too many pages of this book go by where it's the azkaban guards because we have to build suspense and intrigue and 
also make me want to beat my skull against the spine of the book. Uh, Harry starts comparing inflating Marge to 13 counts of murder and wonders is if he's going to get sent to Azkaban. And, um, I mean, true statement. I'm fairly certain that if he wasn't picked up by the night bus, he probably would have got hit for jaywalking, which I'm, I think subjects you to the Dementor's kiss in this world. I'm just guessing. Uh, I'm not really sure how the legal system works because I don't think they know either. Um, and he was supposed to get hot chocolate, but Stan spilled it on his pillow. Does he get a refund for that hot chocolate, or is that just like, eh, tough luck? I mean, he's rich anyway, but still, it's not the point. Just saying. Back to that consumer review. Eventually, it's Harry's turn to go where he's supposed to go, because there's other people on this bus too. He's not the only one that tripped, fell, and summoned a bus. We're reminded about the Leaky Cauldron and Diagon Alley and all of that, and here's Fudge. Question. How did Fudge know Harry was going to be here? Anybody? Anyone want to explain that one to me? Okay. Uh, He guides Harry into the Leaky Cauldron. Stan keeps calling Harry Neville, even after he knows who Harry is, because, well, Stan's stupid, but funny. And now we're having a chat with the Minister of Magic, and there's tea, because of, of course there is, and Fudge is giving him the, like, you scared us speech. And we learn that Marge has been deflated and memory modified. And that is bullshit. I want her remembering every second of what it was like flowing through the air and wondering, is this the day I die? Because she is the worst. But whatever, no harm done, according to Fudge. Not yet, anyways. Fudge has yet to do all of his harm. We're getting there. Uh, Apparently, the Dursleys are still pissed, but they will take him back as long as he, like, doesn't come back until summer or whatever. Uh, Now, Harry's bracing for his punishment from the minister, but apparently Fudge just wants him to stay at the Leaky Cauldron. Oh no, twist my arm. That was the worst punishment ever. I thought I was going to go be, like, cellmates with, I don't know, what is the... I... That joke was going to go somewhere pretty inappropriate, so I left it in my head, but all right. So, Fudge waves him off and says that he's not going to be punished. Uh, Harry clocks Fudge kind of waffling and notices that there's something really fucking weird about everything that's going on for him right now. And that likely isn't going to be important to the book at all. Um, But now Harry's 13. He has his own hotel room. He has Tom, the barman, innkeeper... Janet, like, does Tom, does Tom have a time to, never mind, we haven't gotten to that part of the book. Uh, Tom is the babysitter, and that's just completely normal. Uh, And Harry remembers, oh, Hogsmeade, hey, minister, I know you've got some pretty important documents that are on your desk that you haven't signed that have probably been sitting there for three months because that's how, you know, government works, but would you mind signing this piece of paper that says that I can go to Hogsmeade? That's a big fat no from Fudge. Tom takes Harry to his room, and Hedwig is already there waiting on him. Atta girl, Hedwig! And we get a little bit more description, and Harry passes out. And that's the whole chapter. I It's a little bit of like, comic relief with Stan and some some government incompetence foreshadowing with Fudge, but that's like all that happens, and like this could be one of the shortest episodes of Belated Binge ever, because I don't really have that much that I can even dig into with this, like this is this is kind of a nothing burger of a chapter for, in a lot of ways, like obviously we've got Sirius Black uh, explained a little bit more which is I mean, it's helpful setup, obviously, um, for the book. We've got Fudge, again, being weird, which is, 
I guess, helpful clues for what we're about to find out with with Sirius in a little while. Um, but there's not really a lot going on here. It's We rode on a bus, and we had a chat, and that was pretty much it. I think, I mean, the main takeaways here are that we should n- remember that the weird shape that he saw that freaked him out was dog-shaped, um, which is obviously serious, trying to come say hi. And that's also kind of weird, like... I get maybe Sirius just knew the general area and just wanted to get like sneak a peek at Harry. He didn't intend to make contact or anything. But then when he sees that Harry is like run away, he didn't transform out of dog form and like speak to him like a human. I guess maybe it's fair. Harry doesn't know who he is. He's probably just seen his face as a wanted criminal and he's going to be in whatever jumpsuit they put prisoners for Azkaban in so I guess I guess it makes some sense why he wouldn't reveal himself Harry doesn't know that they have any kind of connection yet but I don't know it it still it is a little bit odd to me because I would think that somebody on the run maybe if you're an Animagus you don't think this way but like I would think you would want to I don't know probably first things first like get somewhere to adjust your appearance um in human form too so that you can be like uh you know not in prison garb if you do come out of your dog form but again maybe if you if you can turn into a dog like why would you give a shit i don't know i guess i'm talking in circles at this point because there's not that much to really talk about in this chapter i could tell you a story about um how uh a as a well you know like i can't even relate too much to this um i got a ho i would like like a buddy of mine we went on a little uh vacation and we got a hotel room by ourselves when we were teenagers and and you know what nothing fucking happened we just like slept in it and we'd go like out to do things but like we were teenagers so it's not like we did much um we were in a completely different state like we were there to visit his dad and we just crashed at the hotel room i don't know um i don't even think anything i mean maybe we got like a couple of beers or something like it woo my goodness um so it's not even a good story really like to equate to this i don't know i got nothing for you we're just gonna move into chapter four the leaky cauldron and hopefully I'll have something more fun to really uh, to weave in here than than just recounting this particular chapter like the last one. Anyway, um, now our barely a teenager is on his own. Uh, we need to hear about what he's doing. He's having breakfast in the Leaky Cauldron, which apparently is open all the time. You can get breakfast there and you can get wasted at night. So that's cool. Um I guess I may am I making an assumption there? I guess we I thought that we were under the uh impression that when Hagrid brought Harry here the first time when he was 11 that it was a bar. Is that not the case? So I assume if it's a bar, it means it's probably open pretty late, serves alcohol. He's going to be there getting shit face hammered and apparently you can have breakfast there. So you yeah you got the whole spectrum do you have to leave Uh, i assume when it closes they like make you get a room there or something i don't know that's an interesting business model over serve somebody tell them that they can't drive home but like hey we've got a room you can stay in for 146.99 we'll discount it to you for no dui (laughs) haha do magic people in this world get duis Is there a law against operating a broomstick under the influence? Can you operate while drunk? And I think this came up on a podcast that I went on, and for the life of me, I can't think of what it was. Um, I think it might have been part of the conversation that got uh, edited out of uh, of the PuffCast um, conversation, maybe. I might be misremembering that. Or maybe I did it with, uh, maybe it was with, when Sarah came on here in one of the last chapters of um, 
of Chambers. You know what? I don't I don't remember where this joke originated. I know that it's been said with this microphone in front of my face though. But tell me that getting drunk and then traveling by flu powder isn't a game that like Fred and George would play or the Marauders would have played where they just get hammered and jump into the fire and just see where they end up and you just pop out like on somebody's living room floor or something and yeah I I don't know anyways um food for thought Diagon Alley during the day is where Harry spends his time. It's basically an outdoor mall, so this is right up the alley of a you know, preteen or a, or a just turned teenager. Um, he'd do his homework at Florian Fortescue's and get a shit ton of free ice cream, like a Sunday every hour on the hour. I hope that they have like the magic equivalent of extra strength tums or something, because my stomach would be wrecked after like the second hour and he's supposed to have sat here like all day for several days uh apparently he's also practicing responsible financial habits because he won't buy cool shit um even though he has the money to do so uh which is good for you harry you have more um more restraint i guess than than I did or would. I was certainly never rich, like, by any stretch of the imagination, but I also was not fiscally responsible with the money that I made uh, as a teenager. Um, Luckily, at 13, I literally had none, so that wasn't a problem. But, you know, 16, after you start working and get a little bit of, start getting a little bit of cash that's yours, guess what? That shit was gone. It was all in my car. I bought car parts come like that was it i the amount of speakers and and parts that it would just blow your mind like why why would you do that zach why why would you well you know what fuck you it was fun all right uh the biggest temptation that he has is a new broom it's supposed to be the fastest in the world a firebolt and we get to read the brochure, but he does recognize that the the kind of the old adage, uh, if you have to ask the price, you can't afford it. Although, yes, it is Harry Potter. He can't afford it. But, like, you might be thinking, um, you know, it's not a good call if you've got to ask the price, typically. And you also might think that we're getting a whole lot of information about a random broom. And you're correct, but don't read much into that because I'm sure none of it is going to matter at any point in time in the rest of this book or the series. Nope, nope, forget it all. Okay, so Harry bought all his school shit. He got his robes, his books, and and, and all that. Uh, He learns that the book that Hagrid gave him is the book that they need for care of magical creatures. And apparently these things are killing each other and biting the store manager, and, and that's the the um exasperation and the like relief and gratitude shown by the store manager when Harry says he already has that book is uh, is palpable. I think that's the correct use of palpable in this scenario. Uh Harry does get his divination book. Uh again, it's a lot of background on the divination book. Don't think too hard. This won't come up again. Nope. Especially the Death Omen book. Don't don't think about that one second. Large Black Dog? Nope, that probably doesn't matter. Probably doesn't matter at all. Uh, he gets the rest of his books and he, and he goes back to his room. He's a bit stuck on that Death Omen thing and the dog that he saw. So I guess it does come back up in like... Now, <laughs> luckily the mirror talks. Um, so that's cool and kind of talks him down. It's... <laughs> It's uh, a bit heavy-handed, this um, this black dog and this death omen stuff uh, in the beginning of this book. And I don't really have a problem with it. Okay. Harry's starting to see people he knows. Uh, he sees Seamus. He sees Neville, who's lost his book list, which is absolutely a foreshadow to Neville losing everything. 
which is going to be important again later with one particular object or uh, piece of parchment that he loses that becomes kind of important and kind of almost gets somebody killed. Um, yeah, we'll get there. Although, say, notice how I said somebody killed? Ha, 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 ha. If you know, you know. Now, Ron and Hermione are here, and Ron looks incredibly freckly, and Hermione, very brown. Those are the descriptions. And for the Hermione is African American crowd, this is a very, very good line. Uh, for the anti Hermione is black crowd, I guess this is how Harry describes a tan? I think I would use tan. But I personally fall into the Hermione is Emma Watson camp. But what do you expect? I grew up alongside her playing that role. And even though I wasn't plugged into the series, I wasn't sleeping in a basement with no windows either. Pop culture existed and so did puberty. And I'm going to leave it at that. Harry Potter may not have been my um personality or whatever but um i was a 13 year old boy at one point in time and hermione is emma watson okay (sighs) apparently the two of them have been looking for harry uh they've heard about his aunt already i'm not really sure how i assume ron's dad got word because he works at the ministry but i feel like that's a stretch because it's way outside of his department um they go back and forth for a little bit they're all staying at the leaky cauldron apparently ron got a new wand which is good he can suck a lot less at magic now which is a good start not just remember not just because the stick that he had last year was broken but it was never his to begin with you know the wand chooses the wizard and all of that he was using a hand-me-down wand from somebody else so the wand never chose him it never was going to work properly and then it was broken so it was already a stick and then it was a broken stick for the most part for ron so now he gets to suck less because he has his own wand hermione's got a ton of books which is a bit of foreshadowing that um I mean, it obviously that's going to come back up. She's essentially taking a way, 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 way more classes than anybody else, and that kind of becomes a thing. Uh, Hermione gets to buy herself an early birthday present as well. Her parents, who aren't part of this story at all, gave her some extra money. Uh, she wants an owl, and Ron tells us how Scabbers isn't doing so hot, which is more foreshadowing. Are you noticing a trend here? These, like, first few chapters, they don't have much happening in them. Eventfully, they are just littered with Easter eggs. Just a whole shit ton of them. A whole shit ton of them. Um, now, that means we're headed to the pet shop. Because what we need is medicine for a rat and an owl. That's our intention going in here. The witch examines Scabbers and gets the gist that this is pretty fucking weird even the other mice are acting weird he looks super shitty she knows that he's got some kind of weird powers um makes a specific reference to the fact that it's missing a toe and that it's lived way too long for a garden rat she offers a new rat but ron goes for the rat tonic instead again so much foreshadowing here and i yeah of course it's lived way too long to be a rat it's not a rat it's a guy it's missing a toe yeah because it you know blew it off or whatever to frame Sirius. Sirius, who just broke out who's also a fucking dog like all of this stuff like is just all over these early chapters uh in this book and it's insanity that we didn't catch on to at least some of it i guess the first time around but how could we i don't like at best we could have thought well that seems suspicious you think all right so now we have a cat named crookshanks that goes after scabbers and hermione bought the cat instead of an owl you know how hermione's the emotionally intelligent one of our trio she kind of missed the mark on this one 
But, uh, side note, I do personally enjoy the fan theory that Crookshanks was the Potter's cat. And nobody had wanted him until now. And now he's back with Harry through his best friend, who's also Muggleborn. Very smart and kind of a lot like his mom. I think that's kind of cool. Hermione's not really worried about Scabbers, but did bring the tonic for Ron. So, cool. That surely should be great. Let's add a cat and a rat into the uh, trio dynamic a cat that's already tried to kill that rat shouldn't be a problem now we're chatting with ron's dad good old arthur and we get more bullshit about um the story about sirius black and the azkaban guards and we're going to keep calling them azkaban guards so we can keep beating that hint to death uh, we get more backstory on his siblings and Ginny being embarrassed around harry Percy's pompous as all hell. Fred and George are making fun of Percy because he sucks. Uh, Mrs. Weasley is over it and also a little disappointed in Fred and George for not becoming prefects. A lot happening here. And so it's dinner time. And we learn that the ministry is actually sending cars to take them to the train station. And Arthur tries to play this off like it's not special treatment for Harry. And Percy's a douche. Uh, Harry packed up and hears Percy like yelling at Ron about his lost head boy badge as he gets back to his room. Um, and Harry also overhears Mr. and Mrs. Weasley yelling at each other about Harry. Which is just perfect plot timing too. He needs to be walking by at that moment of course. Uh, and it's about Arthur wanting to tell Harry the truth about something, and Molly's just not on board. He wants Harry to be safe, guesses Harry would be dead already if the nice night bus didn't find him. We learn that Sirius Black is after Harry. Molly says he'll be safe at Hogwarts, and I'm going to be honest, this is super fucking backwards. Molly ends up being the overly protective type, but I guess not yet. And we needed more black story, you know, on Sirius. He's at Hogwarts. He's in Hogwarts. He's in Hogwarts. And that's what he was doing apparently in his sleep. Just so Harry can know that another murderer is trying to kill him. And also, more about Azkaban guards. And they'll be at the school. Great. Can't wait for that. I also can't wait for that to stop. I don't know why it annoys me so much. But it doesn't make sense. Like... I understand that we don't know what a Dementor is yet, and you want to make the reveal about it, like, to us, but I feel like there's got to be, like, a... This just doesn't seem like the way that people in this world would talk who actually know what Dementors are. I guarantee you that we could go through, and somebody's probably already done this because every fucking nerd's done everything in this fandom, like... If we were to go from chapter, I think, I think it's five, um, where we get the introduced to Dementors, I would bet that not one time after that does anyone refer to Dementors as the Azkaban guards. They call them Dementors because that's what they are, and they know what they are. So why... In the world, would they all be calling them Azkaban guards now? Just because we don't know. They know. They wouldn't be doing that. Anyways, I also, I want to say this too. um, And I'm full of it today, I think. Um, I think it's just one of those days. So, welcome to my rant session, I guess. I, I like to poke fun at these books. I want to make it clear that I don't think these books are written poorly. (laughs) I think these books are phenomenal. That's why I'm, I enjoy them so much and why I'm reviewing them on a fucking podcast. Literally pouring hours and hours and hours of my life into these, this content, talking about these books. Because I enjoy them. But I do like to poke fun at them and point out things that are silly and don't make sense to me when I look at it through a logical lens. Because that's what makes it fun for me. I'm a sarcastic person. I tell people that get to know me, if I'm not giving you shit, 
it means I don't like you. And I treat these books the same way. But I am not one of these people who has come into these, like, being obsessed with these books for my entire life and then learning the person who wrote them is kind of a dick about some things that are important to me and now all of a sudden I think that they're written poorly and I think that they're bad, like, writing and that the plots are stupid and and all that stuff. If that was the case, I wouldn't have enjoyed it the first time. I wouldn't be enjoying this part now, and I wouldn't be wanting to talk about it on this podcast. Okay? That is my rant on that particular instance. Now, I also am totally fine if you do not like the person that wrote these books and don't want to support them and think that they're a trash human being. Like, I'm, I'm, yeah, you, you can, yeah, go for it. But I I don't then translate that into also these books that I thought were amazing up until this point are now not good anymore. If that makes sense. It does, however, bring opportunities to read them in a different light when you do uh when you do come to certain parts and points in the books, like maybe you can read a little bit more into them but it doesn't mean that the books weren't good. Like, they literally were a cultural phenomenon and have with, like, it's 20 years later and there's still, like, hundreds of these podcasts that exist. People are still talking about these things. People still, like, identify themselves with, like, their fictional house representation and, like literally these books are like their personality they were good fucking books all right now that uh, that's all i'm gonna that i have to i have to stop now uh molly uses the dumbledore argument in this with with arthur nothing can hurt harry at hogwarts with dumbledore as headmaster apparently molly did not read the first two books like two months ago her daughter was nearly murdered at hogwarts Harry saved her life and, and Fox, and I guess with Dumbledore there, Fox is there, so that makes it safe. I this just, uh, I, yeah, I I just I feel like Molly is speaking out of character in this scene. Is what I'm saying. Uh, Harry hides before they can catch him eavesdropping because everybody likes to know that the subject that they're arguing about is sitting right there at the door, hearing everything. Um, he grabs the rat tonic and used, you know, an, an excuse for uh, him to hear everything. Uh, and he runs into Fred and George, who are laughing at Percy's rage, and it's all well and good. It's awesome. Uh, of course, they're the ones that took the badge, duh. Um, they've also updated it, so that'll be fun. And Harry goes to bed, thinking back on his last couple of weeks through the lens of Sirius Black is after me, which has got to be terrifying. Um, But he agrees with Molly at the end of the day that Dumbledore makes him safe at Hogwarts. And the guards, the guards, the guards, they must be good at it because, you know, he didn't just escape from them. The thing he is upset about, though, is about not getting good Hogsmeade because he's 13 and he's already escaped Voldemort three times, so he's feeling pretty okay with his chances. And that's the chapter. A lot of foreshadowing, a lot of setup, and again, nothing really happening. But still an enjoyable little read, just not a shit ton to talk about. Uh, and make lengthy podcast episodes about. Uh, So let's do some house points uh, before we get out of here. In true Hogwarts fashion, these points are completely subjective with no oversight and fully at my discretion. This week, I am giving house points to Harry for his self-control and being pretty mature for a 13-year-old in this scenario. 10 points. Stan Shunbike, I'm giving you 10 points for making me laugh. Like, a lot. Uh, Arthur, for actually wanting to give Harry some important information about his life? An adult? Actually do it? Yeah, five points for Arthur. And Fred and George, offsetting Percy with humor. Five points collectively, because uh, Percy sucks. And 
I'm also going to take away some house points from anyone who said Azkaban guards. They get five points apiece taken away. Okay, before we go, expecto plot changeo. Let's rewrite Harry Potter. One small change at a time. The expecto plot changeo question from this couple of chapters is, what if the night bus didn't show up when Harry saw the large black dog figure? How could that have changed the events of the chapter? What about our series? I'll share this question with a video across social media on Instagram and Facebook Reels, YouTube Shorts, and TikTok. I will also post it on Twitter, and you can respond with your thoughts on any of those platforms at Belated Binge, or you can leave it as a voicemail on my website, belatedbinge.com, to be featured on an upcoming episode of the podcast. With that, we've reached the end of this episode of Belated Binge Harry Potter. If you enjoyed this, please follow and subscribe on whatever podcast player you're using right now. And if it supports a rating and review option, please leave one. And if you're so inclined, check out the additional benefits available on patreon.com slash belated binge. Thanks for listening and telling all your Potterhead friends how cool they could be just like you if they were listening to belated binge Harry Potter, no matter how late they are to the party.